the elders, holy ones, 800-year-old red cedar and Douglas fir. These lands of old growth, cloaked in early morning mist, whisper with ancient songs and stories. Awakened and illuminated, a thin place, a liminal space. An invitation to simply walk from here to there. From the blackened embers of old beliefs and identities into a more visible and alive, wild indigenous self. Thresholds such as these require honor and respect, an offering of dried tobacco and yellow cornmeal for safe passage, a prayer to the ancestors to light the way, placed gently in the burnt hollow of a tree, enveloped by earth and braided with roots and ash. Offering accepted, entrance granted, you step through onto hallowed ground, consecrated by the soles of your feet on dark virgin soil, pulled forward by some mysterious force, unconcerned with the comforts of a life you have outgrown. Loving now silently those you once loved out loud, you move across a landscape of memory and belonging, following the distant sounds of old church bells and river water. The most difficult river crossings you don't see coming, no warnings. The very nature of their existence flowing from some cold, clear, dark mountain spring deep in the underbrush of your psyche. So now you must cross this river and your attachment, everything and everyone you have known, slips from your grasp. Some thresholds disappear behind you the moment you cross, offering no return, no forgiveness. Other crossings happen quickly. You barely notice the slight wounding, a small scar inscribed into your skin by the silent gatekeepers. The old ones remind us offerings must be made at such places or they will be taken. There will be a loss, there's no way around it. Some thresholds bar your entry, waiting for a wiser, more humble approach. And some are never to be crossed at all, for the very price of doing so could be your soul. Some thresholds open for a moment, then close, never to open again, while still others, like the flickering of fireflies on a warm summer evening, open and close and open again. And again, offering a piercing light of liquid grace into the darker crevices of your mind. Some crossings can take years or even lifetimes to navigate. Like the bloodlines that have come before, footprints and heartbeats left in the ground, they carry the deep and sacred storylines now etched into your face and hands. Not seduced by destinations or acquisitions, distractions on the journey. Into the desert you now walk, dragging behind you the red prayer bundles of your people, the prayers of your descendants, human and non-human, calling you home to the one life that you belong to. Future generations cry from another more distant mountain, Leave us your medicine in the ground so that we may live. Four days and four nights, you sing and cry and pray. No food passes your lips. You smell of desert, sweat, and fire. Something above calls your attention. An eagle feather falling from the bright blue sky into outstretched hands. A prayer answered. A 300-year-old spell finally broken. White hearts and desert bones draw new stories in the sands at Council Wash. The story of your passage, the forging of character and the crafting of an elder, worked in deep by the underworld, refiners, fire and stone. Medicine for the people, human and non-human. After many years and many crossings, you carry a shaft of golden light in your eyes. A blessing for the one who on some ordinary day walks by your door on their way to some routine importance. Suddenly they find themselves in a rainforest without a compass, a trail marker, or a whistle. The old maps are of no use here. Only deep listening and the distant sounds of old church bells and river water. Oh, thank you for reading that. I don't know that I've ever had it read to me. <laughs> it's beautiful. 
takes me through all those things. All those things actually happened um, at different times. Um, <clears throat> thresholds and river crossings, this, this betwixt and between, you know, globally, we're at one of these places. We could say globally, uh, we have been asked to go up on the sacred mountain to let go of the, the old stories that we have about ourselves, about the way we've lived, uh, that don't work anymore. And we don't yet have the new story. And so this, this threshold, this betwixt in between place is a place of, uh, you know, as the Lakota used the word hemblecha, meaning to cry for a vision, to reach out for something greater than yourself. Um, <clears throat> so it's... Uh, Excuse me. Um, I, um, Leah, are you recording? Okay. Yes, sorry. I see it. Okay. There it is. Okay, a little red dot. <laughs> <clears throat> so I received a letter <clears throat> containing an account of a recent suicide. <clears throat> My friend jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge two months ago. She had been terribly depressed for years and there was no help for her, none that she could find that was sufficient. She was trying to get from one phase of her life to another and couldn't make it. She had been terribly wounded as a child and her wound had not been healed. She destroyed herself. The letter had already asked, how does a human pass through youth to maturity? Or I would add from any one phase of life to another without breaking down. <clears throat> and it had answered with help from tradition through ceremonies and rituals and rites of passage at the most difficult stages. So it's an excerpt from a book by Wendell Berry called The Unsettling of America. Um, certainly a story we know to be true um, in a lot of different ways. Um, and we think of, uh, when we think of initiatory passages, um, that first phase of the initiatory passage, we, we would call the calling. And... Um, Unfortunately, callings most of the time aren't, aren't filled with this, this inspiration or this, this aha moment or this direction that comes and says, you know, turn this way and there's, you know, a moonlit path and all this joy and said, this is the way. <clears throat> Usually these callings come in darkness and uh, in great challenge. Um, and so when we find ourselves in those places, it's important that we don't misinterpret uh, the, the, myth, the mythology of the calling. And, and uh, as the person who uh, jumped off the bridge, this tendency to misinterpret something is needing to die, but it's not us, it's not the human, it's not the life that needs to die. It is something else so that something can be reborn. <clears throat> so these periods of, of darkness and challenge, I encourage people, um, instead of going to offices of, uh, where people have many degrees and, and are just uh, better at hiding their own dysfunctions than, than we are, uh, to give us assistance, that we, that we don't read these things as pathological, but as mythological. Um, these initiatory descents um, or initiatory ascents. And um, there's an old uh, Native American story, uh, the story of Jumping Mouse. And a um, little excerpt from the story says, but there was this roaring again in my ears, said Little Mouse. It was faint, it was very faint, but it was there. One day he decided to investigate the sound just a little bit. And so leaving the other busy mice, he scurried a little way away and listened again. And there it was. <clears throat> he was listening hard when suddenly someone said, hello, hello, little brother, the voice said. And the mouse almost jumped out of his skin. He arched his back and his tail and he was about to run. <clears throat> and then the, the voice said, hello, 
again said the voice. It is I, Brother Raccoon. And sure enough, it was. What are you doing out here all by yourself, little brother? Asked Raccoon. And Mouse blushed and put his nose almost to the ground and said, uh, I, I, I hear a roaring, uh, a roaring in my ears and I, I just came to see what it was about. <clears throat> a roaring in your ears, replied Raccoon. And he sat down, he said, what, what you hear, little brother, is the river. The river? Mouse asked curiously. What is a river? Walk with me and I will show you the river, Raccoon says. So it's some, from an author named Hyamo Storm in the book Seven Arrows. It's a, a classic story of the quest. Um, we think about rites of passage or even the name vision quest, or we could say uh, walkabout, or we could say hill walking. Um, the, the idea of going into the wilderness, uh, being called there by some force, as the poem said, some force unconcerned with the comforts of a life we have outgrown. <laughs> it's, it's, not, uh, it's not concerned with those things. And it pulls us into this landscape of uh, severance, like we have been pulled globally. Um, and so the severance phase being the second phase of a rite of passage, um, where things begin to fall away. Uh, in many, uh, many sacred teachings, they talk about death as an ally. And we have certainly witnessed death as a teacher for us during these times. Death as an ally uh, has little to do with dying and has everything to do with living, how to live uh, clearly, intentionally, with integrity, with impeccability. Another uh, one of my teachers, Melodoma Somme <clears throat> from West Africa, shared this story with me, <clears throat> um, a story that embodies this teaching <clears throat> of the severance phase of the initiatory passage, this letting go, this dying process, this death lodge, if you will. <clears throat> he said, uh, there, was this, there was this man in the village and he woke up in the middle of the night, uh, startled awake. And he looked over there and sitting on the dirt floor beside him in his hut was death. And death was looking at him. And uh, of course, what did he do? But he freaked out and he got startled and he got up and he started running and he ran and he ran and he ran and he ran. And he ran, <clears throat> and he ran all the way deep into the night. He was so exhausted. And he stopped and he thought about it for a moment. And he thought, this isn't far enough. Death was just over there. So he started running again. And he ran and he ran and he ran. He ran all the way into those early morning hours, you know, what we might call the grandmother time or the dream star time. This uh, around 3.30 in the a.m. when everything's really, really quiet. So exhausted, he fell over, collapsed, fell asleep. And you know, sometimes when you're, when your spirit's restless and you try and sleep and your body just jerks awake, well, this happened to him and he, and he jerked awake and he thought for a moment again about death. This isn't far enough, he said to himself. And he got up and he started running and running and running and running, ran all the way into the next day, through the day, furthest village outpost he could get to, all the way in to the evening of the next day. And he just collapsed, completely exhausted, no waking up this time fell asleep. Late into the night, he woke up again and looked, and there again was death sitting there beside of him, looking at him, looking back at death. And death said, I came to see you back there at the first village to tell you I would meet you here. I came to see you back there to tell you I would meet you here. And so this, this teaching of, uh, you know, how do, how do we live? How, how do we, uh, do we, uh, as another one of my teachers would say, Rocky and Barry would say, live your life as a ceremony. Um, and I would tell you that's a practice. It is, it is not a perfected thing. Um, something to constantly remind myself of. Um, but it's more about how we live. And to use death as an ally, uh, I mean, don't be afraid of death. 
Be afraid of the unlived life. For a day will come when it does tap you on the shoulder. And so the, the initiatory passage of, of the calling, which some often I say begins in darkness. You know, we, uh, we think of things in, in our Western society. I don't know if I would call it a culture, but in Western society, we think of, of beginning as, as something that happens with light. But in the old days, in the old calendars, the old ways of measuring time, the beginning began with the dark. Time was measured with night. The, the beginning of a new cycle around the sun began at the end of October, as the Celts would say, with Samhain, and that being the, the dream time, the entering into the dark time. These were the times of the, of the, the beginning. Um, so we think of the, the dream time, the dark time, as where real beginnings happen. And so we're in one of those. We're in one of those passages right now. Um, and as I say, don't mistake the darkness uh, for the end, but for the dreaming. And so this, this uh, passage into the severance phase of a, of a rite of passage um, is uh, in, in preparation, is what I call death lodge. And um, so that if you think about your life, uh, generally speaking, if you think about your life at least in this one lifetime, beginning at birth and, and going this way, kind of like a river that flows this way and, and flows all the way to death in this one lifetime. And so this, this one river flowing this way in ordinary consciousness, ordinary reality, and yet somehow there's another river running parallel to it that runs opposite the flow of life, coming from somewhere in the dark fertile soil, as the, as the poem indicated, somewhere in the west, this river comes and it flows right next to this one uh, in a parallel way. And it begins with a death and ends with a birth. And so such is the way of initiation, such is the way of a rite of passage, is that they begin with, the, with an ending, with the dark, and end with a birth. And so <clears throat> when we're in one of these these uh, initiatory passages, um, maybe we fell into it, got pushed into it, or um, volunteered to step into it. Um, but as, again, as the poem indicates, these gateways, these passages require an offering uh, because where one doesn't make an offering, one will be taken. There will be a loss. There's no way around it. Um, it has to happen for there to be this birth. And so you have the calling and then you have the severance phase or this what's called the death lodge phase, this preparation for the, uh, the passage. Um, now in the, in, in the rite of passage, the, the, the uh, dream quest, vision quest, vision fast, all these, these names of indicating the threshold phase. <clears throat> it's what most people think of when they hear that word vision quest is they think about the threshold phase. They forget about all this stuff that got them there. I always think the, the most potent and powerful part of the quest is everything that got you to the foot of the mountain, uh, to, the, to the base of sacred mountain. And um, <clears throat> so this, uh, <clears throat> this middle place, this threshold phase following the severance, uh, it's neither there where we were and is not over there where we're headed. It's betwixt in between. It's uh, like if you think of all the, all the, these religions, all these kind of notable religions on the planet, they all began with somebody going into the wilderness, fasting and praying with no provisions and receiving uh, uh, a soul encounter an awakening to their medicine and then a return and delivering that medicine. So we can think of Jesus in 40 days in the desert. We can think of Buddha going into the Bodhi tree, Muhammad going up on the mountain, countless Native Americans going into the desert and questing. Um, that, that this, uh, as I tell people, these initiatory passages uh, will happen in our lives. They don't require uh, you to volunteer for them. 
they some if you don't volunteer they'll they'll come get you and eventually they'll just pull you into it and again i think as a planet we have definitely been pulled into it um the old stories just don't work anymore <clears throat> so in this threshold phase this betwixt in between time this is the time of surrender um and not surrendering to anything that you might conceive of, but simply uh, surrendering completely. It is, um, you know, as the in indigenous languages, they don't use as many nouns as we tend to use in the English language. Uh, the the use of nouns creates oftentimes what I would call a a constricted or dead language. <clears throat> um, they would use many more verbs because verbs imply relationship and living. So even, even this Lakota word, the hemblecha, it, it's not a noun of a, not like the word vision quest, it means to cry for a vision. So it speaks of a, of a surrender. Um, and so this, this surrender that happens during the threshold, um, to let go to something greater than yourself, um, it's what uh, makes us, it, it, it puts us, it makes us available to grace and spirit. There is no guarantee. Like I've been on a number of vision quests and I've guided lots and lots of vision quests. There's no guarantee that one will have what one might call a soul encounter or a, a, a otherworldly experience. There's no guarantee of that. Even if you did all the right things um, but you can make yourself available to receive grace uh, to, res to to be met by the sacred um, is that you you make yourself available to the sacred by emptying out your palms and your heart and your belly um, as on on the fast and something maybe comes in some new awareness so uh, what, well, I, would, I wouldn't say a new awareness. Actually, I would say a memory. A memory in, in uh, many indigenous cultures, there's this, this concept. And when, I, when I'm referencing indigenous cultures, just so you know, I'm talking about your ancient ancestors. So that if we turn and walk down your line of your bloodline lineages, if we went far enough back there, we would find practices of, of uh, connecting to, to ritual, to earth, to nature, to seasons, uh, to community, to the sacred. Um, they would exist back there far enough. We just have to travel a long way in some of our lineages than, than in others. So I'm talking uh, about that. So if we, if we were to go to that place, there's what I found is this common understanding or common teaching that would go something different than West, what I will call Western society, which Western society would say you're born uh, and at a certain point we will be able to measure your aptitudes and your interests and then give you an occupational handbook and a, and a degree maybe, and you'll figure out what to do with your life. Um, from an indigenous culture, they would say, no, no, it, do, it, it doesn't work anything like that. The way it works is you came here from the realm of your ancestors, <clears throat> your ancient ancestors. And you came here because it would be as if you look down here and say, they need this medicine and I can bring this medicine. So I, I'm gonna take this down there and you look around the realm of the ancestors and you say, and I need your help and your help and your help and your help because you too carry the same medicine. And so when I get there, I'll need you to stay connected with me so we can do this. We can deliver this medicine that we came here to deliver, this gift, this essence of who, who each of you are. And uh, so then we come into this world. It starts to close up around the age of four or five, sometimes even six, it might stay open. But in, in consensus reality, those awarenesses begin to fade of that relationship. And... Um, and so then we, we start to adapt the mythologies of a greater culture. And if you ever want to know the mythology of the culture or society you live in, 
go into the town and look up and see what the tallest buildings are. And that will tell you the mythology that is the, the undercurrent or unconscious mythology uh, that is operating here. So uh, initiatory rites of passage, they are uh, in place to activate the memory of the gift uh, and the relationships that carry that same gift that you have. Um, and once activating the memory of that, uh, to, to begin to walk that, that road. Um, so that when you go up on the mountain, this threshold phase, so we go up on the quest, you go up on Questing Mountain, Sacred Mountain, you don't go up there for yourself. Um, that's kind of what I call a, a psychological workshop mentality. And we're going to do this thing because it'd be good for me. Well, it, it might be good for you. Uh, it might not be comfortable, but it, it'd be good. Um, but this idea that you go up there on the mountain so you can remember this, this gift, this beauty that you carry. And that you once remembering that, you can bring that back to your people because they're hungry for it. And if you don't deliver the medicine that you came into this world to deliver, it ain't gonna happen. Nobody else is gonna do, nobody else is gonna be you. Um, and, and so often in, in people's lives, that gift goes unacknowledged and undelivered. Um, and so we have uh, these experiences of, of like Leah creates or other people create or these ways of, of creating village to, to see the gift in each other and to call it out. I see this in you and I see this in you. We need that. Uh, we need that in our village. And uh, so this threshold phase is this place of surrender, letting go, what I like to say, letting go so deeply like a dark night of winter that spring simply shows up because you let go enough and that's it for no other reason. And, and we've all probably had that experience of encountering something that was immovable by our will, by our intellect, by our resourcefulness. Um, and the moment we surrendered and let go, something shifted, something changed and we can't explain why that happened but grace entered because we finally let go. We made some room for spirit to come in. Um, so letting go doesn't mean giving up. Letting go means to make room for the sacred um, to, to enter. Um, and then something shifts or this, this awakening, this memory can happen uh, that, that puts us on a, an alignment with a path that was there waiting for us the whole time. Um, it's like the thing that which you are searching for in your life is also searching for you. One of these days you're going to run into each other. It might be out in the, out in the wilderness, uh, or it might be literally you have a car crash and you run into somebody and that's it. That's the thing. <laughs> um, so the threshold phase, being up on the mountain. And then the final phase is the, the return phase, returning to your village. What does that mean? Well, you're returning, uh, with a new story, a story that lies in front of you, not behind you. I used to have my, uh, my old teacher, Rocky and Bear, used to say, you're walking backwards. And what he means is that you're, you're focused on the story behind you, trying to navigate yourself you know, further into your life. He said, you're walking backwards. He said, so when you come off the mountain, you come off with a story that lies in front of you, this one that calls you into it. Um, and so in the, what we call the giveaway ceremony, this way of returning, the giveaway ceremony becomes your life. Maybe you come back with a great question. You know, it's not all about the answers. Actually, the questions are what we follow. The questions are what guide us. Uh, the answers, we tend to stop once we got them. So one thing I learned early in this work is that you want to have a really good, potent question that you can live into one that takes a while, maybe lifetimes, uh, that, you can, that you can live into and pass on to the next generation, have those kind of questions. Um, so this return to the village in the giveaway, listening to stories, sitting in the, the council circle with elders that hear your story and mirror back, this is what I hear 
in your story. This is what I hear about you. This is the medicine that is reflected in your story in that time in the wilderness that, it, that I hear in there. And so there is a need for elders and there are a need for young people waking up to their stories and need for elders to hear these young people um, and, and mirror back in you know, what they hear in their stories. Um, we, we, you know, culture becomes lost uh, when the dreams of the youth and the contribution of the elders are disregarded. Um, a culture becomes lost. Um, so this awakening uh, and, and listening to the dreams of the youth and calling them forth and, and giving the elders that place of, of uh, offering what they can offer. Um, so we can keep, keep, keep going here. So the calling, the severance, the threshold, the return, and then the giveaway is, is your, your life. So these are the, the common stages of an initiatory passage, a rite of passage. Um, they can happen, as I say, all of those phases can happen unconsciously, collectively, as we're now in. Um, and, and this is important, just because they're happening doesn't mean they will be useful or helpful unless there is a, a way of them being held and guided and, and met and supported. So you take the young woman at the beginning when I read that excerpt from Wendell Berry's book, um, there were no elders present to guide this one and she misinterpreted uh, that which needed to die as herself. This happens so often. Um, did not know that this, this uh, darkness could have been mythologized and awakened into a birth. Um, so we, we need to, we need to call on our elders. We need to call on, uh, to, to be present with our, our youth and whether our youth are 40 years old these days, because, you know, some, some, some of us never had those initiatory experiences. So youth is not related to age the way elder is not necessarily related to age. Um, to hold these these periods of, of darkness and nourish them and guide them so that there can be this this other river, as I say, that begins with the death and ends with the birth. Um, uh, so the initiatory passage. Um, so I wanna um I just wanna check in. I have a story that I would like to share with you. And Leah, you know the story and would require some permission to keep our UK friends up a little longer. Um, and uh, are we good with going on a little bit further? Do we get a thumbs up? If not, you can go to sleep, I'll be all right. <laughs> okay, so that is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna share a story with you. I'm gonna change this. I'm gonna slide this computer back a little bit. Uh. All right, can uh, Leah, can you hear me okay? Is the volume good? So give me a thumbs up if you can hear me all right. Yeah, you're good. All right, good, all right. So I want to share a story with you. And the thing about stories is, uh, I've heard it said once that if you understand the medicine story, then the story is dead and has nothing more to offer you. And that the purpose of medicine stories are not that you understand them, but you notice the point of the story that reaches out and grabs you and pulls you in. So that maybe I started telling the story and it was going on for a couple of minutes and all of a sudden something happens in the story and it grabs you and you're in. You don't know what I said before then, but you're all of a sudden in now. So noticing that moment of a story. The other thing to notice in the story is the moment of a story where your attention stops. And I might keep going in the story, but somehow you're still back out there in the desert with eagle or coyote and you don't know where I went. I didn't even notice that you stopped, but you're still back there. And that's where you stayed. 
And then the third place to notice of a story is the place in the story where something happens in the story and a door opens and you leave this story and you go into your own story. Maybe in the one from before, maybe one that's down the road ahead of you. And you don't hear any more of this story because you went into another story. And what happened there? And what happened in this story that sent you out the door? So in medicine stories, that's why in medicine stories, you can hear them hundreds, thousands of times with, a, with, a, with an attention uh, because it's never about knowing what's going to happen. It's more about relationship. It's stories of living and breathing entities. And so to enter into relationship as you're entering with this curiosity of what, what, what part of the story might grab me and stop me or send me out the door into another story. So listen from that place. So as they say, once upon a time, or once below a time, or once sitting around the fire in a global village online in a place you think is in time, there was a village. In that village, there stood in a circle of warriors, shoulder to shoulder, facing outwards around the lodge. Within that circle of warriors, within that lodge, sat a circle of grandmothers facing inwards. Within that circle of grandmothers was a woman bringing new life into her village. Outside this lodge could be heard sounds of drumming and singing and prayers of gratitude to the ancestors. Prayers of gratitude for this new life coming into this world because they knew that this new life was bringing some medicine, something they needed. Soon outside this lodge could be heard sounds of deep breathing, grunting and screaming the way you sometimes do here sounds of deep breathing and grunting and screaming when a woman is bringing new life into her village. And as lightning touched the ground beside that lodge, you could hear the cries of this infant child in the village. And this infant child opened their mouth wanting to speak of why they had come here, wanting to speak about those agreements they had made with their ancestors about this gift, this medicine that they were bringing to this village, but all that came out were cries. And so this little one knew, this wise little soul knew that they should wait and learn the language of their people before they spoke about this gift from the realm of the ancestors. As time would have it, one, one moon drifted over into the next and one season into the next and round and round the wheel they went. One foot in that other world and still one foot in this world and soon they, they had to decide. So they planted both feet firmly in this world and in so doing they began to forget. They began to forget about those agreements they had made in that other realm this medicine that they came here to deliver. They grew up in this village listening to stories. They would sit around the sacred fire, much like the sacred fire that we have going here, listening to the elders tell stories and time and time again, the elders would tell stories of this time of the singing stone. And in this time of the singing stone, this, this little one knew that this was a time of much joy, much connection, much laughter, and feasting, and ritual, and ceremony, and a time when people seemed to be grateful for each other, for the ancestors, for creation. They also noticed that the elders, when they would tell this story, seemed to have a tearfulness 
in their eyes, a moisture, a longing. Well, this, this child grew to that place of betwixt in between. You know that place. You've been there, you know, around 14 or 15, that place of betwixt in between, around 24 or 34 or 44 or 54, 64, 74, 84, that betwixt in between place where you are no longer where you were. And you are not yet where you are headed. You are betwixt and you are between. She grew to that place. When she grew to that place, she noticed for the first time, maybe it had always been there. She didn't know, but she did notice it now that a dark cloud had descended upon their village. With that dark cloud, there seemed to be a lot of forgetting, a lot of ungratefulness and hostility and fear and anxiety. People forgot to acknowledge their ancestors, had lost their connection to the, their place in the circle of life and creation with nature. There seemed to be a lot of fear and anxiety and stoicism. Once again, they were hearing that story of their elders talk about this other time, this time of the singing stone. And so they thought, if I could find that singing stone and bring it back to this village, maybe the people will once again remember. So they went to their grandmother and grandfather and said, grandmother, grandfather, I would like to go find this singing stone that you have told me about around those sacred fires at night. Because our people have forgotten and they are hungry and they are lost. They said, yes, grandson, it is time for you to go. So first go to your mother's lodge for her blessing and go to your father's lodge for his blessing and then return here to this fire. So with that, she went to her mother's lodge. She told her mother of this quest to find the singing stone. Her mother gave her her blessing and gifted her with one finely crafted bow. As she left her mother's lodge, her mother wept deeply for she knew she would never, ever see this child again. And then he went to his father's lodge and he told his father of this quest to find a singing stone. Bring it back to the people. His father gave him his blessing for this quest and gifted him with one finely crafted arrow. As he left his father's lodge, his father wept for he knew he would never ever see this child again. So he returned to his grandmother and grandfather's fire. They said, now granddaughter, at first you must go into the prayer lodge, to the Nipi lodge, to the sweat lodge, and pray for the blessing of your ancestors for this journey. So that night she did. She went into that lodge and over those hot stones and in that dark liminal space, that thin place, that mist between the worlds, cried and she sang and she prayed and she prayed and she cried and she sang because she felt the blessing of her ancestors upon her and she returned to her grandmother and grandfather's fire and they said now granddaughter at first light you are to leave this village into the east do not look back for there will be no fanfare for your departure it is likely they won't even notice Remember this, granddaughter. We believe in you. And if you listen deeply to the wisdom that moves across this land, through these forests and mountains and glens, and down these rivers, you may find something out there. So at first light, she walked into the east into the spring morning, into the fresh dew onto the grass, into the pale greens and yellows of springtime. There's some distance in the east, she saw eagle. 
she said, Eagle, can you tell me where I can find the singing stone that my elders have spoken of? And Eagle said, Granddaughter, I cannot tell you where to find this one that you look for, but I will tell you this. We have been watching you since you have arrived. We believe in you and we are standing by you. And if you continue to listen to the wisdom that moves across this land, out here in these forests, these hills, down these rivers, you may find something out here. And I suggest you turn and go into the south and see what is there for you. So with this guidance, she thanked Eagle, made her offerings, and he turned into the south. He turned into the noonday sun, into the hot, green, deep vegetation of summer kind of south he turned. And there's some distance in the south, he saw a coyote. He said, coyote, can you tell me where I can find the singing stone that my elders have spoken of. The coyote said, grandson, I cannot tell you where to find this one that you look for, but I will tell you this. We have been watching you closely. And we believe in you and we are standing by you. And if you continue to listen to the wisdom that moves across these woodlands, down these rivers and valleys and over these mountains. You may find something out here. And I suggest you turn and go into the west and see what is there for you. <coughs> so he thanked Coyote for this guidance, made his offerings. She turned into the west. She turned into the setting sun, into the darker evenings, cooler nights of autumn kind of west, bright colored leaves on the ground and overhead kind of west. There's some distance in the west, she saw Bear. She said, Bear, can you tell me where I can find the singing stone that my elders have spoken of? Bear said, Granddaughter, I cannot tell you where to find this one that you look for. But I will tell you this, we have been watching you very closely since you have arrived from the realm of your ancestors. If you continue to listen to the wisdom that moves across this land, you may find something out here to take back to your village. I suggest you turn and go into the north, see what is there for you. So with that, she made her offerings of gratitude to Bear, and he turned into the north. He turned into the dark, cold, crisp, clear, deep snow kind of north. And there's some distance in the north. He saw some look like steam coming out of the air, and as he got closer, <clears throat> he saw that this steam was connected buffalo. He went over to this great buffalo and he said, Buffalo, grandfather, can you tell me where I can find the singing stone? I have searched the four corners of our land. I'm weary. I'm tired. I don't know where to go. The great buffalo said, Grandson, I have heard of this one that you speak of. I can see that you are weary and tired. However, I cannot tell you where to find this one that you look for. But I will tell you this, we believe in you. We are standing by you. And if you go up there on that sacred mountain, the place where the lights touch the ground, you may find something up there. So with that, he made his offerings to the great buffalo and he went up on the sacred mountain. 
for four nights, four days, he cried and he prayed and he sang and he sang and he prayed and he cried for the guidance of his ancestors to the spirit of that mountain. And on that fifth morning, he had received the guidance from the spirit of the mountain from his ancestors that it was time to return to his village. While he did not understand this, he did trust this guidance. So he made his offerings to the spirit of the mountain, to his ancestors, and he came down off the sacred mountain and began to make his way back toward his village. The way you make your way back toward a village when you've been on a great journey trying to remember something about who you are and the medicine you carry. And as she walked toward her village, she walked into the dark of the night, that early morning time, that grandmother time, as it's sometimes called around 3 a.m. or 3.30, that dream star time. She came along beside the river that flowed from her village upstream. One of these slow moving rivers, gentle moving rivers. And she began to hear a sound. A sound the way you can sometimes hear sounds <clears throat> way off in the mountains that travel just about a foot off the water as if it was right around the corner. It was a long way off and she followed that river upstream toward her village, listening to that sound. Couldn't make it out what it was. So she got closer and closer to her village. She could hear that these sounds floating atop the water, coming down the stream that she could hear in the early morning hours, seemed to be the voices of the people from her village. And as she turned the trail, and look toward the village, she can now see that the path was lined with all the people from her village. They were waving and smiling and saying something. She couldn't make it out. She kept listening, listening deeply, and finally she could hear with the ears of her heart. She could hear what they were saying. And they were saying, welcome home, singing stone. Welcome home, Singing Stone. That night, Singing Stone had a dream. And she dreamed she was sitting by a council fire, not unlike this council fire. She was sitting by a council fire with eagle, and coyote, and bear, and buffalo. She said, I want to thank you for believing in me. I thank you for showing me the way. And the great buffalo stepped forward and said, Granddaughter, singing stone, do not thank us with your words, but let the way in which you live your life speak your thanks, and this we will see. You go well, singing stone. Go well. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So just uh, in honor of the, the place in which that story came, come from to me or came to for me, it was uh, passed on to me by Stephen Foster and Meredith Little some 25, 27 years ago um, from the School of Lost Borders. And um, the source before them is, uh, Stephen said it was only, it was from a, uh, an anonymous Native American source. They did not want to be named. So they just wanted to remain anonymous. And uh, in a way that when we, when we give a gift to someone, if we remain anonymous, then it can't become about us. And it's just about the gift they get. So I'm grateful for that story coming into my life so many years ago and invite you to, to weave it into your life and share it with others as well. So I'm gonna pause and turn this over back to Leah. Okay. Um, 
Well, I'm, I'm going to open it up just for a bit before we close. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask Cater? If so, you can unmute yourself and feel free to ask any questions or make any statements you'd like to make. Does anybody? Thank you for such a beautiful story. It brought a tear to my eye. Oh, it was beautiful. <laughs> so beautiful. Thank you. Anybody out there find yourselves in a, a dark night? Or a calling or a severance or a threshold moment or yeah. And I'll just say thank you for that story and uh, it helped me remember what I went through with my vision quest a few years ago. So thank you very much. That was wonderful. You're most welcome. Well, I always love, you know, these stories, you know, I've known Cater for, you know, I was thinking today, 16 or 17 years. <laughs> it's been a long time. This is kind of why it's amazing. Um, but the stories each time, just even if I've heard them before, like, like Pam said, it just reminds you of the journey. Um, and I want to read, I want to read a poem that, uh, that Cater wrote that really, um, I did my own personal vision quest in 2014. And my medicine name came through a soul retrieval that Cater did with me that summer, which is Thunderbird Heart. And this story is called Follow Your Name. This is a poem by Cater. And I think he wrote this in 2000, um, 2013 is when this is what's dated that you wrote it. Follow your name. Pay attention, pay attention. Be careful not to distract yourself from yourself by focusing on the obstacles in your life. Focus on the delivery of your medicine, not on the stories in your head where you recount your limitations and loss. To indulge in, self, in such self-importance is to avoid taking responsibility for your medicine and the gift of healing you came here to offer. You are the heroes and the heroines of your own story. If you are not initiated into the bone memory, into the mythology of your own life, you will likely be living an existence that is not entirely your own. The life you, you know you must live is the one standing just a few paces in front of you looking back over its shoulder with eyes wide, waiting for you to remember. Apprentice yourself to yourself and move to the frontier of your own imagination, the place where you live in the absence of story, the place where the sharp edges of this unfolding moment demand your full attention. Where are you? Here? Who are you? this moment. Pay attention, pay attention. Do not appear in the world in such a way that, other, that others give you a name that is too small for you. And this poem has guided me through, through the times since I came off the mountain in 2014. Um, it's been a gift and Cater's been a gift in my life. The vision quest work that he offers through Rites of Passage Council has been a gift in my life to be part of that for so many years. Um, and so it's just been an honor to have him here around the sacred fire to hold these teachings for us tonight as we stand at this place of, of our new lives of a big change and how we all are going to walk out into this world as this journey unfolds and how we can hold the light in our medicine 
as we walk forward into this new journey. Um, so I'm really grateful to you, Cater, for the medicine that you offer. Thank you, Leah. Thank you for the opportunity to, to meet all these beautiful people. Yeah. There is one more question in the chat, okay. which is where can we find more of Cater's writings? Uh, <laughs> Cater, I'm going to let you address that one. <laughs> Um, at the tip of my pen, but until they <laughs> come out, <laughs> um, I have a, uh, a personal website. I'm, I'm happy to, if you email me or contact me through the website to send you those two poems, but I have a, a personal website that's uh, caterbrown.com, spelled K-E-D-A-R-B-R-O-W-N.com. And um, so not all of my writings are there, but there's more, uh, more poetry there. Um, and then there's a YouTube channel where I have a lot of uh, interviews and videos and stuff like that. Um, if you're interested in the audio version. Um, but yeah, you can, you can get more of the, uh, more of the writings that I have at that looks like that. Uh, yeah, that website that Lisa just put up there. Did you do it? Okay, very good. Well, is there anything else? Does anybody have any questions, anything to say before we close? Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, I feel like when I get into the moment of these um, meetings that I can go two steps forwards, but how do you prevent yourself from being in the three steps back? I know that's a huge question, but I feel like I go back and forth. Well, it, it would be nice if I had an easy answer that it was always about steps forward. Um, but to remember that the steps backwards are important ways of acknowledging what has been. Um, to turn and say, uh, you know, what are the teachings that I have gained from this? Anytime we find ourselves in those three steps back, it's like, are there some teachings here that I have yet to, to pull out of this story? or some gratitude that I have yet to offer uh, for those, those uh, teachers, even the difficult ones. Um, so I think of steps forwards and step backwards as more really how it goes. When this idea that we just kind of progress on this linear forward motion. Um, you know, I, I, when we have loss, the amount of grief we have is proportional to degree of love we have. Um, and these are not steps backwards. Um, and so to turn and say thank you, to turn and offer uh, a tear or grief. Um, in, in, a, in another way, we think of tears as being the food of the spirits. Um, and we don't feed them enough. So to offer a heartful expression. Um, but to not to see the three steps back as somehow uh, not progressing. Um, no, I think that would be an important thing, that there's a reason to step back. The same way in astrology, when planets go retrograde, even they have this kind of backwards thing they do. <laughs> so I don't think we're immune to this. When our lives go retrograde for a while and we revisit um, moments or stories or emotions. And, um, but again, what is the teaching that I have from that story what is the gratitude that I can offer uh, that teacher, even if it was a difficult one? Um, and that, so that blessing is what also enables us to turn back forward again. Thank you. You're welcome, Patty. Good to see you here, Patty. Good to see you. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, I, before we close, I want to announce next Tuesday, um, our teacher is going to be Elizabeth Jenkins. Um, Elizabeth, hold on. She's, I've followed her for a bit. Um, she is going to be teaching about working with the collective bubble, like the collective energy field. Uh, she's an international best-selling author. 
of the fourth level, the, the author of the fourth level, the return of the Inca and the journey to Keros. And she walks the path of Apaco, which is the Andean cosmology. And, um, and she is uh, going to be teaching us next Tuesday. So all of you will be invited to, we'll, I'll send out email reminders and uh, you'll be invited to gather again around the sacred fire with us. Um, on golden thread, golden-threads.com tomorrow at tomorrow probably midday the recording will be posted of what catered uh, under teachings of of tonight and and there's some other teachings that have happened previously that's on there now and each each week we'll keep adding the teachings and um so i'm really grateful for all of you being here and um and yeah please come to the sacred fire anytime you want to connect in community and feel the support of the people that are gathered here. Thank you so much, Leah. Thank you for creating this space. Yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure. I love it. I love it. And anybody that wants to stay after and visit with Cater, if he's going to hang out, I know there's people from all over. You're welcome to that. I, I think this, this, um, these meetings end when I actually just, hit in. So I'm going to stop the recording though right now.